experience in entertainment media and ip law and in today's session she'll be covering uh, the agreements that are executed during end to end uh, production uh, so nitika if i could uh, request you to briefly elaborate upon your work before we start the session uh, hi everyone um thank you so much for introducing me uh I, it's been it's, it's been a super exciting journey working in the media sector, and I'm so speaking to everyone here about you know the little that I've uh, probably learned and and you know uh, experienced in the media sector as a media and entertainment lawyer. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I uh, have been in the media sector right from uh, the start of my career, in fact. and i began uh, my career as a media entertainment lawyer i uh, previously worked with barucha and partners which was erst while tmt law practice and then i moved to nike nike and company uh, which uh, primarily is a full service firm but majorly deals with very high end entertainment matters and not just entertainment but also intellectual property related Uh, non litigation and litigation and um my work in uh, both uh, barucha and partners and in nike nike and company has been majorly uh, you know surrounding uh, film production and and uh, uh, everything and anything to do with end to end production uh, not only limited to contracts but even advisories and opinions notices etc so i uh, specialize in contractual work uh, more to do with non litigation rather than litigation uh, and uh, i i handle every stage of production for our clients uh, every every contract that uh, you know uh, uh, needs to be made at the pre production production and post production stage is handled by me uh, at night tech and company so that's kind of more or less the kind of work that i'm involved in so i think today's session is going to be more about what i learned and that is uh, more towards production uh, because that's the area that i have most exposure and of course i've also dabbled into talent uh, work and you know broadcasting and and those areas as well and a bit of tech as well but i think film production is what my uh niche is and that's probably what i love doing at nike tech and company that's i think one of the most exciting areas of work and i really enjoy doing that and i am super excited to share whatever i've learned on the practical front with everyone out here Thank you so much for that, uh, ma'am. So, I uh, just one request to the attendees that if you have any questions, do post it in the Q and A. We'll keep taking it if it's relevant to the section, or we'll take it collectively at the end. And everyone who's interested in media laws is requested to stay till the end because we have a special announcement for all attendees. We can start, ma'am. Right. So, I think before I move to contracts, uh, it will be really an incomplete. session if i don't run the attendees through uh, the entire production process uh it's very important i think as a lawyer especially in media and entertainment to really understand how the entire business works for you to pick up contracts and be able to uh, advise your clients and you also need to remember that of course while your portfolio is more specific to that of a contractual lawyer you also need to take up a commercial role at some point of time in your career so i think I, what i'm going to do is i'm going to spend a considerable amount of time first running you guys through what exactly are the key stages of film production and then proceed to kind of uh, give you a peek into how contracts are drafted and what exactly goes into drafting a media contract for films particularly and for web series uh so i think the very first um step for any content production is development 
and by development i mean when you actually get writers on board to write for you you know there's a pool of talent here i'm sure you guys have heard of big names in the industry who write uh, big scripts like meghna gulzar vishal bharadwaj who also is a director you guys may have heard of bhavani ayer you guys may have heard of these really prominent writers you know um those of you who really uh, pay attention to the credit scroll and you all read the news or see a watch shows um you guys must be coming across these very prominent writers and they are the ones who shape the entire content you know and they are the ones who lay down the foundation of the content so it's very important to get very good writers on board and kick start the development stage um development uh, is a part of the first stage of the entire production process which is the pre production stage in uh, film production uh, writers write many different forms of content uh, content and forms of literary works which are copyrightable works uh such as uh, bibles mini bibles uh pilot episodes they write screenplay stories scripts but uh development is always divided in two stages no writer writes the entire show in one go especially in a case of a web series the first stage is the pre green lighting stage where the writer writes concepts he writes bibles he writes mini bibles basically creates a pitch document you know which can be shared with uh, you know platforms like an amazon or a netflix to kind of finance the entire production process now what exactly is a bible or a concept or or if you may ask what is a pilot episode so a concept is basically putting your idea in on paper to simply put it uh, it kind of uh sums up what exactly is going to be your show about you know what is it that you want to bring on screen following which you will start writing the bible the bible of your show is basically uh you know the unique characteristics of your show uh, like the character sketches or you know uh the plot you know and and that uh, is, is kind of uh the the whole of the bible and then the pilot episode is of course the first episode of a web series that you would develop now all these three uh documents are taken they they put together in a package along with a lot of other elements you know which we also call in in a business terms we call them as essential elements we kind of package key elements uh together which includes the concept bible it could also include the pilot episode and it also includes the names of some lead star cast the production schedule the the uh budget you know and all of this is packaged together and it's pitched to a platform by a producer and when a, a platform likes what you're doing uh they like the uh, concept they like the preliminary literary work that you sent to them they uh, ultimately green light it, which means in simpler terms approve it for further development and finance the development and production process and uh, that's how you as a writer and a producer move collaborate going forward and you develop the full fledged script of the film and that script is eventually the premise of your film so development is a, a very critical process and and you know it's um, it's it needs to be really hard for because that basis that the entire production of that content is going to be commissioned when you come to films it's um, it's the studio instead of the platform like you have reliance and your p series and you have these big players and big giants who actually finance uh, film production and they are the ones who look at your package they look at what you're putting on table and and they accordingly finance the entire development and production of the film so the process is the same when uh, vis-a-vis the film and uh, you know web series production but of course the players are different the terminologies that we use even in our contracts is very different 
pre production on the other hand is uh, you know post the entire development process or during the development process once your film and your web series is commissioned pre production is basically the entire stage prior to principal photography when you're preparing for the film when you're preparing for the and the shoot of the film uh so you must have i don't know some of you all must have come across terms like a recce or a uh you know site survey where the shooting is going to take place or like a look test for your actors uh also uh, finalizing and executing contracts that also falls under your pre production stage because you want your actors and your key talent like your director and your and your uh dop to be locked at that stage you know at before the shoot can begin because payments have to be made and um, you kind of set the stage for shooting you ensure that principal photography goes as smooth as possible and finally you come to the production stage which is uh the actual and the most exciting part of the entire process where you actually shoot the uh, entire series or the entire film and post production is basically the finishing touches of the film editing vfx animation effects sound effects and distribution is uh, what takes the cake i think that's what all the platforms and you know studios bank on that's how they make a lot of money and that is actually exploiting the content on different modes and mediums it could be theatrical non theatrical so web series it is non theatrical of course because uh net a netflix or an amazon which is financing the entire project would want to uh you know the whole idea of securing the intellectual property in the entire content is uh or commissioning the entire production of the content is so that they can finally exploit it and they can uh run their entire series on their platform in even for a fox studio or for a reliance the whole idea of actually procuring the film and the ip in it is so that they can for forever uh you know exploit and and for, uh, you know broadcast or uh exhibit the content and exploit it in many different ways you know there are many different uh arrangements of exploitation which i will run you guys briefly through in the course of our session so that basically is uh what it what in a nutshell uh, is you know the the entire process and it's a very tedious process i think uh you know you need to spend a lot of time on ground with your clients and with your uh, audience and your industry to actually understand step by step how it works and of course i am in the process of learning it it's not that easy but it's also very critical i think as a lawyer to understand the nuances of how the industry works and not just stick to the the legal aspects of things and that's how you'll be able to advise your clients better um so this is the development stage like i said uh, finding finance is basically pleasing your entire uh you know your uh, financiers in the sense the platform or the studio because they are the ones who are going to pump in crores of rupees so you can actually make the film and then you start you know start writing the story screen play dialogues you prepare the script you uh, get the lead cast on board there's there are rehearsals there are uh, different things that happen during pre production wardrobe test look test you get everything set and you finally uh, start shooting now uh, securing financing is a very complex process it's uh, it depends on a lot of factors i mean studios and platforms look at many different factors before they really pump in money they see profitability they see what kind of audience can be attracted to these kind of films uh art, art that's the reason why i think artsy film, films don't get that much budget they work on a lot of low budget on a very low budget because big studios don't generally put in that much money as opposed to a masala film you know like a salman khan or a shahrukh khan film and uh, that's because uh, at the end of the day every distributor which is the studio or a platform 
is looking at revenue generation you know that that's where it all boils down to not every studio or every producer or every platform is looking at good content they're looking at actually attracting audience but because at the end of the day you have to recoup all that you have invested in the film and make profit you know that's how it works you have to recover what you have spent and then whatever is the balance is your profit now to reach that margin you really have to ensure that your films do uh, super creatively well and uh, that's what this sums up you know it's risky uh, it's definitely because it's a business so it's risky and there's a lot of investment that goes into it but ultimately the of opportunities of profiting in this industry is massive because given how things are right now the pandemic etc what's really running up and running right now is the media industry with so much content generation even if theaters are not opening fully uh, your platforms are working left right and center platform platforms like netflix are releasing originals uh, back to back so you know because the con- the content consumption during the pandemic include including the time when we were in lockdown was really high so uh, this is one of the most profitable areas of doing business and like i was saying uh, just probably rewinding back to the pre green lighting phase you are uh, basically create the package and you pitch it so this is what generally goes into the 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 entire package which includes your storyline characters and i'm saying this from a development perspective there is also the budget and the the actors the a listers or b listers whoever you want to kind of engage as your lead those also come into the package including your director so uh, this is basically uh, how it works this is basically more or less of how the package works and like i said financing works like this financing also works in many different fashions you know uh, studio financing is one platform financing is also one option there is also co production the way you uh, come together two parties come together one party handles the entire physical production the second party pumps in funds and uh, kind of runs the engine basically and uh, kind of supports financially the entire production and then they sell it to a distributor like a studio and or a platform whatever is the type of content and uh, they get a part profit of it or they get like a production fee from it so that's how it also works that is also one form of uh, partnership or one form of financing So this is a little exercise that I want to do with you guys. I I'm, I came with an idea of making this section uh, session very interactive and not just like a monologue which will kind of really drive you guys down. Uh I have a very interesting uh you know uh question to ask you guys. So all these big ticket films and and uh, I'm just going to kind of focus more on Hollywood now more, more than Bollywood. Uh all the marvel series or titanic or uh, terminator series all of them were uh, big ticket films and uh, what do you think really led to them being big ticket and led to investments and finally led to big returns uh, what do you think for each of the films could have been the determining factors anyone Guys, you can raise your hand, and I'll unmute you to talk. We have an answer uh, in the chat box. Well, uh, Shonak says story. Uh, WG says script. Okay. What else? The actors, star cast. Yeah. Good. Uh, director, probable cast, storyline cast, script, music. Okay. Franchisee. Yeah. So I think I think I got the answer. I think everyone's bang on point here. Uh, mm-hmm. These these are the real key factors. Having a Kate Winslet or having a, like a Andrew Garfield or having like a, I'm just throwing names in these series over there. 
no and having uh, i think more than directors and writers my personal opinion was the cinematography and the star cast that actually led to these films being big ticket films and studios were really pumped up you know because uh, the comics especially for the marvel series if i if i may say it they were a big hit and for them to be adapted in uh, uh, films into films and there also a chain was something else and and that's the same even in case of the harry potter books the harry potter books were something else you know they caught the eyes of so many young readers and when the world of magic came on screen everyone was pumped up to watch it and even if the cast was new in the harry potter series i mean when the sorcerer's stone released uh, daniel radcliffe and emma watson were not known names but what really turned them on was the book and the book was famous even before the film came into into, into the foray so i think uh, every film uh, as a conclusion has different elements that make it a hit or make it a big ticket it could be the lead cast it could be uh, you know the books that uh, were adapted into making the film so there are many different areas that can lead to the film being a success so pre production like i said uh it involves finalizing the script the script is basically a combination of the story uh the screen and the dialogues and that's what makes the script there is scheduling budgeting casting crew contracts crew contracts being the key because lawyers play a very big role during the pre production although let me tell you just a side note between all of us uh crew con uh, crew con uh, crew contracts or cast contracts get signed even after the film is shot and released and i'm not kidding you know because the industry works on a relationship basis people don't pay attention to paperwork in fact the paperwork that needs to be done which are, which are your agreements they actually have to be mellowed down a lot because the media entertainment is not contract friendly in fact if any of you choose at a later stage if you are either working or you choose to work in the media industry you will understand how it is more of an obstacle in the creative process than a help because uh, we as lawyers are so nitpicky on each and everything that it stalls the creative process sometimes and we are not the favorite people in the room we are way below the league and below the hierarchy when it comes to uh likability in the industry uh so we are uh, we are very important okay but we are also looked at more of a hurdle so you know the the film industry or the entertainment industry really wants the legal to work really at a pace you know and just churn documents out that that's how it is uh and yeah this this industry is very fast paced let me tell you that they it's a very demanding industry content is made day in and day out every minute there's a concept written so you definitely have to be on your toes as a media lawyer but uh that being said you also need to make the industry more aware uh, of how important it is not just to sign a contract a night before but actually pay a lot of attention to the drafting and the reviewing vetting and the negotiation bit of it so crew contracts is what we generally aim at signing during pre production and that's how it should be and then there is location scouting which is the same as recce you uh, try to understand how your set is going to be and what exactly is is the production process going to be like or the production area or production location going to be like and then you also uh you know start uh, hiring equipment you know you may need different different kinds of equipment be it camera equipment be it uh wardrobe equipment hair makeup equipment it it's very dependent you know whatever machinery you require to shoot the film and to get the ball rolling is is uh pre production production i think is more or less what i said the actual um you know it, it it's the core of the entire process and let me tell you a fun fact 
प्री प्रोडक्शन एंड डेवलपमेंट टेक्स मोर टाइम पोस्ट प्रोडक्शन टेक्स मोर टाइम देन प्रिंसिपल फोटोग्राफी प्रिंसिपल फोटोग्राफी एक्चुअली टेक्स द लीस्ट अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम एज अपोज टू द डेवलपमेंट प्री प्रोडक्शन स्टेज एंड पोस्ट प्रोडक्शन स्टेज सो वेन एवर एंड इफ एंड वेन यू गैस कम अक्रॉस अ प्रोडक्शन शेड्यूल और यू ऑलरेडी हैव स्टडीड अ प्रोडक्शन शेड्यूल यू विल रियलाइज द नंबर ऑफ डेज टू शूट आर एक्चुअली लेसर यू नो वेन इट comes to uh, busy pre production development and post production so that's so that's a fun fact people think that shooting takes so many days but uh, that's not true unless you know the shoot is stalled for whatever reason it's actually your pre production and post production stage that needs a lot of time so there's a very big team you know that works in production and as a lawyer when you start doing contracts you're going to realize that you you're going to literally be spending two months or three months on a project just churning out contracts on a daily basis that's because production in itself the film or the series that is being made it's like a project you know it's it's got so many different people associated with it and i'm not just talking about the key elements the essential elements like your writer director and actors there's a world beyond that too the people who make it happen are actually the ones who work really hard on screen and are not the ones who appear on screen they work offline to ensure that everything is on track uh, starting from your assistant directors your costume stylists your costume designers your makeup and hair stylists uh, your line produ- producers your head of physical production uh you know the list goes on i mean if you if you're doing a non fiction kind of a documentary or like a like a docu drama kind of a thing then you need researchers on board who can actually go on ground and get the facts for you and uh, if you're using uh, historical footages or pictures of a real life content to get the licensing from certain organizations there are research agencies who help in that so contracts with them so you're just going to be churning out contracts you're going to be interacting with so many different people like a location sound artist or a production designer art director the it, the list is huge you know and that's the strength of a production team you'll at least have 40 to 45 people and that's probably a more understated number but these are this is the strength that's actually working on a production and it's it's a big project uh, and and what you see on screen is just two hours of a year and a half worth of work by a team of almost 50 people post production i think is uh, the most tedious thing especially when you're doing animation and vfx or when you're uh actually uh sort of preparing the entire content for release it's very tedious because this is where you actually have to ensure a uh, lot of things even contractually and this is a big nexus to contracts i'm sure a lot of us who are working in the media and entertainment sector we put a very important clause on credits for each of our talent or each of our crew members the post production team actually has to ensure that the credit scroll has everyone's name in the credits because credits is a moral right under copyright act and if you don't give the person credit you can actually be taken to court as a producer and that whole obligation lies on you and also one thing we need to understand uh, as uh you know lawyers we need to understand who has the bigger liability here in terms of ensuring that everything is done in a very methodical manner without errors or omission the liability in case of a film or a flat or a web series lies on the producers because the producers are the ones who are delivering the content the contracts that are done with producers and platforms or studios are very tight so when you probably start uh, you know uh, working in the space and when you start doing more high end contracts you realize that 
producers have to indemnify for every every error and omission which is kind of a very uh, libelous and oner onerous clause and anything that goes wrong uh, you are made a co defendant you are made a party in suits and it's kind of a big issue anything that goes wrong i mean i don't know how many of you have been following the current litigation on bad boy billionaire and uh, you know more controversial contents and you will realize that how producers are along with platforms and studios are actually uh, dragged into cases in fact uh, talking about credit specifically because it's an obligation on producers to ensure that every person gets credit otherwise they actually run the risk of being sued there was this one matter in in uh, court i don't know how many of you all read it it was a it was a film that released last early jan and there was a there was i think uh, a very uh, renowned supreme court lawyer who didn't get credit in the film and she actually took the producers and the distributors to court and they had to settle by recalling all the uh, uh masters of the films which is basically the footages of the film they had to recall it and actually put in a credit and redistribute it so you can actually imagine uh, how much money went into that and what kind of a loss it was for uh the producers and for the reputation of the distributors because it was all over the news so i think uh, the post production team has a very big responsibility over their shoulders and so does the pre production team uh, post production also has to be very mindful about the kind of effects and the editing that they do uh, i don't know how many of you have seen this film called drive uh, which had the, the late sushant singh rajput star in it along with jacqueline fernandez and that film had such bad editing you could actually see green outlines uh you know uh, uh, surrounding each artist i mean uh that's how bad it was photoshopped and it was edited so um it's very important that you know you you know your your post production team is damn good and super good with whatever they are doing now coming to distribution i think this is the most tedious and cost uh the most serious and, and and the most costly stage of the entire production and distribution process but also the most important obviously because uh, this you know this is where studios actually come into picture and this is this is why they are kings or platforms are kings or broadcasters are kings because they have the potential and the power to actually take content uh across the world you know they distributed worldwide like you have a fox studios who will distribute your content all across india across 800 to 1000 screens in case of theatrical distribution and uh, they have their own platform disney hotstar so they will exploit it there and they will actually uh put in tons of money to kind of uh ensure the promotions happen well to ensure the marketing happens well and they will really really invest you know and these are the big bad guys that you actually need in your uh, kitty you know you need good distributors and good platforms to associate your content with uh now these are the guys because like i said they are the big bad guys and they are the kings the reason why i'm saying this is because they have a very big bargaining chip you know for your content for people to see your content it's just not important to make the content it's imp it's important that it reaches the audience now the reason why uh, these guys really rule the entire industry is because of the kind of network and the money that they have and the contracts that you do with these guys they are very tight knitted contracts very difficult to negotiate you know uh, the reason being that they have 100 other producers pitching to them and trying to get the content get the finance to make the content and the finance to sell it uh, so when you are negotiating contracts with these guys you will see some very common clauses for example all the marketing decisions creative decision rights rest with them 100% they have a one sided indemnification whether if there's any third party claim 
they have you you are to have competition to indemnify all the intellectual property that is created in the film as a whole and even in the underlying books of the film which is your performances by your actors the script uh, all the, the art direction and you know uh, producer uh, production designing and every anything any form of service that is rendered uh, at that point of time during the during the production or pre production or post production of the film every ip emanating is actually held with the studio or with the platform in perpetuity and i know a lot of people have come across the word perpetual perpetual actually means in legal terms 99 years but that practically means forever so they are the ones who hold ips for years and generations and they are affiliates you know like they are uh, uh, partners affiliates associates uh, different uh, you know subsidiaries that they may be running they get to exploit the work so it's very difficult to cut through the contracts of these with these distributors and platforms they have the bigger bargaining chip of course there are some production houses who are the bigger players and whom even platforms and distributors would actually want to partner with and collaborate with uh, but uh, the smaller players who are still upcoming though they make amazing content they still are a more compromising position unless they really negotiate hard and they have good lawyers uh, with them uh, on their side so this is all about distribution uh, they these are the guys who because they have the bargaining power i always call them as the bad guys because they literally run you over as producers and you just have to kind of really bow down to their terms a lot of times so there are different ways of distributing content which i'm going to very quickly touch upon because these are the kind of contracts you will do or uh, lawyers who have joined the session and are in the media industry they end up doing these uh, you know agreements and and uh, before we get into agreements i'll probably have you run through the various modes of distribution which are your new technologies and theatrical distribution so there are two broad categories one is like i said theatrical distribution of content and second is non theatrical distribution of content and if you guys have ever had a chance maybe in your internships or practicing lawyers who are currently into non litigation you may have come across these uh, nuances and these terminologies or maybe done contracts only in relation to either of these modes of distribution so theatrical is theaters non theatrical is basically airlines hotels uh, airline distribution hotel distribution there is a dvd rental dvd sale pay tv free tv these are basically your non theatrical modes of distribution um i think uh, it will take another two three sessions or maybe more to actually explain each one of you how each mode works or you know what are, what is the meaning of each mode of exploitation but because we are sort of going through a time crunch and i'm just kind of put this on display like you know like a consolidated uh you know uh, modes of non theatrical distribution so you guys can maybe read up a little on it or maybe get in touch with me offline and i can actually probably run you through definitions of these uh modes of non theatrical exploitation another very big mode of exploitation and what really gets the uh, what really helps uh, you know producers and platforms and studios actually make a lot of money is music exploitation and music distribution and as you all know i'm sure most of you all do uh the entire music industry is literally run by labels uh you have t series you have tips you have yashraj's music label i'm sure everyone has seen and heard and you know probably viewed these guys these guys on youtube and you guys may be listening to music on youtube and streaming you'll actually see their logos popping up and cropping up here and there 
the reason being that labels today have that kind of uh, hold in the industry where they uh, actually have the potential and the facilities and the reach and bandwidth to optimize and exploit and monetize the music you know and because these music labels are so strong again when it comes to producers the music labels tend to override them in contracts tend to have a bigger bargaining chip when it comes to negotiations but music labels like these actually during especially during, before the film is released like a, when there's a pre music launch and and when the track has to be released of the upcoming film and to create like a fervor uh, amongst uh, the audience you know and kind of it's like more of a marketing gimmick but it's also got a monetization angle to it these labels actually take that music to different music streams you know music apps like a savan or a gana they are the ones who have that kind of network and potential to take your music to these guys and optimize it you know so uh, also selling it to youtube you know youtube also is a big revenue generation pool so your music will actually get exploited there and there will be millions of people watching your music and they know okay this film is going to release at the same time the music garners views and youtube pays label so i think uh, this is how exploitation and distribution works more or less and and maybe as we progress in the second session i'll probably show you guys samples of agreements so you guys get a better hold of what exactly are the terms and conditions of a music distribution uh, agreement or a non theatrical distribution agreement or a film exploitation theatrical exploitation agreement. uh I, there are a lot of things that go into uh, you know this is more like ancillary information if i may say but it's uh, probably very critical to understand and you will see this we put release dates and contracts even when you do like an acquisition deal where uh, you as a producer are approached by a studio you approach a studio and a studio in lieu or instead of giving you money for funding takes certain rights uh from you like 100% exploitation right like a pen india or a t series if they enter into like an acquisition model they will probably enter into a deal with you where you will create the film produce the film and they will only take certain rights from there in lieu of giving you funding and uh, they are the ones in acquisition deals if you see they are the ones calling the shots on when the film should be released and if you don't release it by that day they actually uh, there's a whole angle of cost of capital which starts getting imposed and they penalize you they reduce your funding there are many different cons of that but you will see this it's very critical uh, as a commercial legal lawyer to know when the film is going to release as a producer to ensure that you're protected in terms of the release date you're not breaching the contract in any manner you're asking for a buffer period so go so that is one bit of it second i think uh, when the film is releasing is also very critical given the uh, time and situation you know if you're releasing a, a patriotic film on 15th august it's actually going to get you people you know people to <clears throat> it's going to get you audience people are going to visit the theater and they're going to watch it so many different factors uh, from a marketing perspective that go into release uh, nikita i just have to stop you one second your voice is coming really low uh, just suddenly the past uh, 10 15 seconds okay is this better uh, it's not uh, i can't hear you properly if the other people are not facing any problem then we can go ahead yeah so it's fine you... on my end yeah i'll right. go ahead Yeah. all right sorry then we can continue yeah so i think more or less i mean uh, this is more about distribution uh, as a part of exploitation and distribution guys you will be doing a lot of marketing agreements okay and marketing is a is also one of the key activities of a film because like i said it's not enough for a film to be released you know uh, 
the the film will uh, will literally have to uh, see the light of the day uh, it it has to start attracting audiences before it can be released uh, and that's where you have film promotions and you have uh, uh, premieres and you have a lot of marketing activity that uh, you know uh, uh, really comes into uh, it becomes really relevant you know so i think uh, sorry guys just sorry so like i was saying uh, marketing is uh, a very important uh, key element now in marketing you will be doing a lot of these in film branding agreements okay uh, sponsorship agreements you will be doing uh, film festival agreements you will be doing a plethora of agreements you know you but the key ones are basically your in film branding your sponsorship uh, Barter deals in in film branding and sponsorship, and a lot of these film festival agreements. Uh, in film branding also for, forms a it forms a part of the revenue pool of the film. So when a brand comes to you and they say that look, we are really interested in product placement in your film, or we are very interested in like doing a promotional gimmick or like a promotional event for your film. they actually don't do it just for free i mean the producers don't do it just for free they don't just place products for free they actually ensure that uh, the the brand sponsors a part of the production budget of the film or the marketing budget of the film and they uh, really add to the revenue pool you know and and it's a very big business right now in film branding i'm sure you guys it's not a very new concept but i'm sure you guys have seen uh different uh you know in film branding and out film branding scenes in different films maybe i don't know how many of you all have watched uh closely watched and observed the kind of in film branding that happened in three idiots three idiots in 2009 was one of the biggest films of the millennium that aside they had a kickass uh marketing strategy both in film and out film and there were so many brands who actually invested in these guys and uh, got their products placed and even did out film you know branding for these films so you actually uh, your your production budget is slashed by half when these brands invest with you uh, with you and in you uh, and in the film in instead of the placement that you're giving them so that too is actually a very big going to be a very big part of um you know the the different agreements that you do and you will have to be very uh, systematic when you're uh, you know very particular even commercially when you're negotiating an in film placement deal so i think this is more or less like you know a a overview of the uh, entire production process of the industry and uh, these are the important agreements that you know go into uh, uh, or you will have you will come across these uh, agreements and you will start probably uh, negotiating drafting and vetting these key agreements so it's it's not just uh, one section of the industry that really uh, you know uh, results in the film being a hit there are so many different areas it's complex you know the environment the industry is very complex but it's yet in interesting 
and it's beautiful it's not a very organized industry and as a lawyer i think you will have to really get used to the way your clients are working but it's uh, it's a very colorful place to be it's not all that glamorous so just trying to break the bubble of everyone who wants to enter the industry because it's very glamorous but it's it, it's giving you a chance to actually work uh, be, uh, you know kind of go behind the scenes and see how the teams work is giving you a chance to represent people fight for creatives fight for talent which is so underrepresented in our industry and is stepped on by big producers and studios so that's that's like more of an introduction to uh you know uh the entire production process and what are the kind of agreements that go into the production process and probably in the uh, coming session uh, what I, what i intend to do is that i intend to probably uh, beam up this beam up key talent and production post production marketing endorsement agreements etc on screen and kind of take you guys through the clauses that are there and i think that will require uh, another session of 60 to 90 minutes so is for you guys to actually understand the clauses you will have to read the clauses and understand how the legal language works so uh, that's what i look forward to to uh, achieve in my next session great uh, thank you so much uh, should we take a few questions from the attendees yes, yeah so uh, i'm going to unmute dev jyoti because he has uh, posted a long question and i think he had a few more questions so i'm just going to unmute you you can ask uh, ma'am yourself okay. yeah please go ahead uh, hi uh, thank you so much uh, it was a great uh, presentation i uh, just wanted to ask you now just there has been a number of amendments in the 1957 act uh, by virtue of the 2012 act now uh, when you represent let's say authors or uh, let's say produce uh, people who have produced a musical work Uh, or a sound recording now when that is when they assign their rights uh, to these big production houses now as per section 18 they are still supposed to get an equal share of royalties even post assignment uh, do you see that happening actually in practice are those royalties actually still shared or is it still on a lump sum basis and these people really don't have any bargaining power although the law uh, provides for for such a such a right that's my question it's yeah, a great question uh, you know and that really puts puts me uh forces me or compels me rather to kind of address the ongoing gray areas in the law you know because right now i understand there are there are all your provisions on royalties and there's a section on copyright society and all of that is in place but you know the problem is that we don't have in reality a mechanism as to who pays royalties and uh, exactly who has that liability and how are the tariff rates supposed to be implemented and all of that there is so much gray area right now there so definitely you guys must have heard about the iprs or uh, you guys must have heard about the ppl the uh, singers association you guys may have heard of all these different copyright societies but have you guys heard of a performance uh, society or have you heard of like a writers society nobody has heard that right so right. uh music set aside what happens to the other royalties that the other authors are supposed to get even if you're saying it has to be a 50 50 division you don't even have a proper society established secondly the societies that are established like i said are music centric if you see iprs ppl you will understand that all of them uh have certain flaws and fallacies when it comes to the way they disburse royalties first of all there's a big debate on who has to pay is it the producer the exploitation uh, party there's so much of gray area even if you see the language in the law in the act It, it gives you an idea that it is the exploitation party that's supposed to pay. 
but that's never written now i don't know how many of you have been following the yrf matter that you know where an ed notice was served to yrf and they were actually booked for not paying royalty but the whole uh, uh, debate here is and and why i think it's flawed is because how can you hold them responsible when you do, you don't even have clarity in your law books whether they are responsible or the exploitation party is responsible because ultimately yrf is not exploiting on their own they are the ones who are producing the content right so who is it that has to pay to these societies and also iprs has a tariff system which is arbitrary let me tell you that for a fact when it comes to calculation of royalties I, we understand there is a 50 50 break up for producers and authors of musical works but there is so much of discrepancy when it comes to calculation of the royalty till date iprs has not been able to give us a clear rational as to how they calculate their tariff rates so how do they implement those tariff rates and how did they reach to those tariff rates? so it's uh, your question is amazing now what as lawyers we do uh, we played always safe you know that's what we are supposed to do what we do is we just put a clause in our contracts and a lot of contracts you'll find it of course there are different different contracts will come come across you know there's one in one contract like a netflix contract or maybe like a studio contract or platform contract maybe you will see clauses like the royalties that are payable have to be will include Uh, or will form a part of the fees that are being paid, and you as a author have to waive, or as a contributor have to waive your right to royalty. You will find these clauses. But what we do, I mean, in our firm, uh, a lot of the practice is that we should put a clause, a neutral clause, you know, to kind of address this ambiguity, this this gray area, by saying that. whenever there is an amendment or clarification which in due course of time i'm very hopeful our legislators will uh, push for this or the copyright board will push for this whenever we get that clarity the authors should collect it from the copyright society and this works really well because produce neither the producers nor the platforms or the studios uh, have their obligation to pay or you know if you are fighting from the producer side or you are negotiating from the producer side or drafting their contracts you obviously don't want to take that onus because the law is unclear so you would just put it on the copyright society and ultimately when this clarity who has to pay to the copyright society is it the exploitation party or the producers ultimately the law is the one that's going to dictate it and anyway whoever tomorrow has to pay will have to pay you know there is no getting out of that so the way we you know it's a big debate on whether there is clarity no clarity what is the language what can be done what can't be done but as a lawyer when you are out there in the present circumstances if you have to draft you have to make it a neutral clause so it's not on your client if he is a producer that you know he has to pay so there cannot be that ambiguity in your contract thank you so much I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Uh, we'll just take three, four more questions. I am allowing uh, Rujvi Mehta. You raise your hand. Please go ahead. Um. Hi. Am I audible? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the great session. Um. So my question is regarding the distribution of films on on YouTube. You know, if uh, I'm a, I want to. i have a film which is extremely low budget film and i want to distribute on um youtube um so is the is generation of income through advertisements the only medium or are there any other options as well uh are you saying if you want to like make a short film and you want to distribute it on uh, youtube that's your question uh yeah a short film or a short series um youtube yes, i think yeah i i got your question i think youtube is a great mode of revenue and a great mode of advertising and also get more of earning advertising you know and getting sponsorships for short films because uh, generally i don't know if you've seen how platforms who have avod like avod platforms i don't know if you 
uh, observe like if you're watching a coffee with Karan, for example, on the premium model of, or premium platform or version of what stuff, you'll see that there are many ads b- between the content. Yes. That's because uh, these brands, like I said, they sponsor the process of exploitation. They sponsor and that's how they get a slot on that platform. Mm-hmm. And that is how you see breaks between if, if, between your content because unless you don't pay, uh, I mean, unless you don't do and if you don't pay as a viewer, you know, uh, the only other way for the produce the platform to make money is to advertising. So there are models, you know, SVOD subscription video on demand and AVOD is advertising video on demand. So there are many different forms of earning revenue for the platform. Uh, generally, if you're going to basically, uh, you know, publish a short film on a YouTube or you're going to distribute it on YouTube, uh, you, if, you're, if you're really, I mean, for YouTube to monetize and for YouTube to gain something for that, they are going to put advertising. Also depends on how uh, you are doing your contracts or your, uh, what is your uh, paperwork with you? You know, what are their policies? So it really depends on all of that. And ultimately, the revenue is being pocketed by YouTube. And if your views cross a particular threshold, you are on income. That's how it works. Yes. But let me tell you one thing. A lot of people uh, don't prefer monetizing films on YouTube. Because again, uh, what you get out of it is, is is not as much. It's not a very profitable venture. Of course, in, uh, you know, if you're doing like podcasts and you're doing like these, uh, you know, videos and and short form, short format kind of things. I mean, that that definitely could. The more viewers you get and the more subscribers you get, your revenue model uh, or your profits turn, uh, you get more profit, your profit margin increases. But uh, I have not seen a lot of people directly exploiting a low budget short film on YouTube. I mean, that's not the more, most preferred mode. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll just take one last question. I'm unmuting Akshata Pai. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is, as uh, you said, YouTube is an upcoming platform. Uh, uh, can you highlight what would, how would be their different contracts they are coming up? And uh, additionally, I want to know uh, if it, uh, if I'm asking correctly, a lot of the YouTubers come up with the promotion, you know, uh, be it for film promotion or, uh, you know, brands and all. But is there any uh, review committee or anything who actually sees whether the products what they are displaying are, uh, you know, your visible or no to advertise or no? So are you asking me what are the policies of YouTube in terms uh, of advertising and... Uh, um, in terms of how will be the contract form that will be having the liability, if at all some uh, consumer protection or some issues come up, who will be liable? Is the YouTuber who's promoting it or the, um, you know, I'm sorry, uh, the promotion or whoever is signed up for that? I mean, who will be liable if your contract has to be placed in that? Okay, so I uh, I haven't done a lot of YouTube contracts myself because I've not been in that space. But uh, from what I understand is that YouTube doesn't do like full-fledged paperwork. They have their own terms and conditions, basis which, you know, they entertain content and they broadcast it on their platform or they uh, play music or whatever videos, etc. And it's like more of a self-publishing kind of a platform. I think uh, whatever be the infringement claim, all their TNCs have a very strong indemnity and they have a very strong uh, takedown policy as well. So the liability is definitely going to fall on you if they are dragged in for anything. They also have certain rules and regulations when it comes to how much duration of uh, third party material can you broadcast and that will not lead to uh, infringement. They use the principle of de minimis uh, in a lot in their policies. So they have a very stringent system. 
they uh, issue take downs they they will hold you liable they will ask you to indemnify they will put very strong representation and they will try to shove off the liability so okay by any platform uh, that's how it works be it a youtube be a youtube or a netflix or a amazon prime everyone has these uh, very specific clauses in their documents always okay thank you so much all right so uh, i think that's all because uh, you know we've already crossed six so any other questions we can take it up in the next session so the people who have not joined our whatsapp group for uh, webinar updates i've posted in the comment section you can uh, join that group and uh, as i was mentioning in the beginning we have now a special uh, you know option for all attendees to get their articles published on ip readers so i've posted the three things that you have to do to uh, you know get uh, your article published first you have to post on linkedin summarizing the session uh, whatever you learned today tagging uh, both nitika and lawsico and then you have to also attend the next webinar of the series and uh, lastly send your 1500 word article to me at aprajdadlawsico.in uh so uh, nitika i think you're stuck uh ruhi can you hear her yeah no i think uh, her video i can't see it all right so uh thanks all the attendees i think we'll see you all next week so make sure that you follow the three instructions okay oh i think she has exited she back all right okay. yeah yeah that's okay that's okay so thank you everyone uh, we'll see you all next week thanks ruhi